Before anything, we would like to acknowledge that the land that the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee people. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect indigenous peoples of this land. Westfest is the Ohio State University's annual Science and Sustainability Festival. This program is made possible through a grant from the Ohio State Energy Partners. I'm Monica, and I'll be behind the scenes making sure everything goes smoothly. If you share about Westfest on social media, please use the hashtag hashtag OSU Westfest. Automatic captions have been enabled for this session. You have the ability to enable or disable the captions to suit your needs. We hope to make this webinar as interactive as possible, and we definitely want to hear from you. So please feel free to add your comments in the chat and post questions for the presenter in the Q&A. In particular, this is a Q&A section se session. So um, you adding questions to the chat or the Q&A would be a key part of this program. We will be checking both periodically throughout today's program. If you received one of Westfest activity kits, there were a couple of astronomy activities. So if you tried them and you have questions about that, I'm sure Wayne will be happy to answer them as well. Um, and if you did not receive a kit or don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can download that from go.osu.edu slash WF book, and I'll write the, this link in the chat uh, in a minute. And you can download a booklet which includes this activity and other activities. Um, and like I said, two um, activities related with astronomy that you can do at home. Right now you are attending Ask an Astronomer, presented by Wes Lingman from the Department of Astronomy and the OSU Planetarium, which if you have not been to, I really recommend that you visit the OSU Planetarium because it's really cool. And I am now going to turn it over to Wayne to get the program started. All right, thank you, Monica. So one of the first questions we had is how can um, kids ask a question via audio or, um, or in chat? You are welcome to do either. I can read the chat or read the Q&A and answer the questions. Or if you want to use the raise hand feature um, in Zoom, we can be allow you to speak. So that makes it pretty easy. So first questions, this is a who can stump the astronomer? Because I think there's a prize if you can stump me. And this happened on Monday. Um, there were questions at least about the space program that I did not know the answers to right away. Um, so, hey, you're going to get stickers. All right, here we have some questions. So I'm going to allow you to speak. So go ahead and tell us who's asking the question and then ask your question. My name's Irina and I want to ask, how was Neptune created? Hi, Irina. Neptune was created when all of the planets in our solar system were created. Um, so we have different types of planets in different places in our solar system. You might know that there are four rocky planets in the middle of our solar system. Then we have two gas giant planets on the outside of our asteroid belt. And then we have these two ice giant planets out farther than that. And Neptune and Uranus are ice giants. So in each case, you have, um, or at least the way I like to describe it, it's like you're building a solar system out of Legos and the sun gets all of the Legos, but in the inner solar system, maybe you can only build planets out of red ones because it's too hot for anything other than like rocks to really exist in the inner solar system. Like everything else melts and is turned into a gas and it floats away. But then when we get out to where Jupiter is, um, we start to be able to play with every color of Legos and we can start to build really big planets. And then as we get farther away um, out to where Neptune and Uranus are, gravity is, can pull stuff together and there's still material, but there's less of it. And so you end up with a few smaller planets and it's a lot of really, really icy things. And when astronomers say icy things, we don't just mean water ice, that's one of the ices, but there's other things like ammonia, the stuff that we clean with, or um, methane, the stuff that cows can fart out. 
Um, so that all freezes into these ices as well as other things, and that can build up planets. And then because the planets are huge, Neptune and Uranus are still huge, um, but then they can turn back into gases, but that's what makes them a little bit different. And the methane in their atmospheres are what makes them look blue and green. Really great question. While we wait for the next question, in the box, we put in a scale model of the moon and earth where you have 30 bouncy balls and a tiny little pony bead, which is about a quarter of an inch in size. And if you put them all together, then that makes a scale model of how big the earth is to how big the moon is and how far away it is. Now we have another scale model on campus that you can walk. So this one is for the entire solar system. And so the sun is on main campus. It's up by um, kind of where the planetarium is um, on Woodruff. And you can start at the sun and you can walk all the way out across the river to get all the way to Pluto. And Neptune happens to be on the other side of the river as well. So it's a really long walk, but it's really cool to see where all the planets sit um, at their appropriate distances and their appropriate sizes. Now we're used to scale models when we're playing with toys because when we play with like a toy car or a dollhouse or um, anything that um, can fit in our room, we're usually playing with something smaller than we are. And then, um, so like a toy car is, can fit in your hand, but it's meant to represent the big car that you might ride into school. Um, and so then we can play with those and those are scaled down versions or basically um, the same idea of what a big car is, but it's made really small. Um, and that's what a scale model is. So we are kind of used to doing these all the time, or maybe we drew a tree and the tree fits on our sheet of paper, even though the tree is really, really big. So here's a good question. When can we visit the planetarium? Um, next weekend. Um, next weekend, we have the Friends of Ohio State Astronomy and Astrophysics Science Talks in the middle of the day. And then we are going to do a Halloween program that is meant for people to dress up and we're going to tell some spooky stories and explore the sky together in the afternoon. And so I'll be putting that up on our website very shortly, planetarium.osu.edu. But we'll have some cool things there and then we are working on putting public shows together um, as I get new people trained. We're also going to have a star party next week and you can stay tuned for that too. Ira would like to know what happened to all the old books where Pluto was a published planet. So some of those books still exist in classrooms because the rest of the astronomy is correct. In the state of New Mexico, Pluto is a state law. It's a state law that Pluto is a planet, so they don't have to change their books. They don't have to agree with all the astronomers. But um, I still have some of them myself because I don't throw away books. But what happened in 2006 was that astronomers got together in the International Astronomical Union. So that is the governing body of all astronomy in the world. So like a thousand or like a few thousand people got together and they voted that because we started finding other objects like Pluto in the outer solar system, that Pluto wasn't really um, a real planet anymore because it has to be this other class of objects. And we have been fighting about it ever since. I'm team planet and there are other people that are team not planet. Um, and I think there's kind of some arguments both directions. Um, and that's where the interesting piece is because the definition is pretty bad. Um, if we moved the earth out to where Pluto's orbit is, then the earth couldn't be a planet either. So um, it's a really interesting and open question. And if you plan on pursuing astronomy, you might be able to help answer it of whether or not Pluto should be a planet or not. So here's another question. What classes did you take in school to become an astronomer? So I didn't know I wanted to be an astronomer until I had already pretty much finished my undergrad. So that's college. Um, in elementary school and middle school, I really loved science. And I read a whole lot of books on science. I read space books. I read ocean books. I read volcano books. Um, I did all sorts of things. Um, that were about basically every kind of science that there was, um, and I loved it. And then in high school, I took biology, and I knew I was going to be a biologist. And then I took chemistry, and I knew I wanted to be a chemist. And then I took physics, and I became a physicist. 
So it wasn't really a choice. I just kind of got excited about what I was studying right then and forgot to change. Um, but then physics started getting more challenging and I wasn't interested in the types of questions that physics was, was solving. So I decided that I wanted to explore astronomy where I was interested in those classes uh, or was interested in those topics. And so the classes I took were a fair bit of physics and math. Um, and sometimes it's hard and sometimes it takes a group of us to learn material. So you don't have to learn it all alone. Um, but then afterwards, I went to graduate school and took a whole lot of astronomy classes. And that's what helped me get to where I am today. Really great question. And for anybody that wants to know, I was in school for 26 years. That's a long time to be in school. Is that from kindergarten or is that? From kindergarten through my PhD, 26 years. Another question, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, would you die if you would land on Neptune, Irina? Um, so good question, Irina. You would because there's no surface to land on. So while the, the big planets in our solar system, this includes everything outside of where Mars is. So this is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We don't really think that there's much of a core because the planets are really big. And so they stir up all of that material that would be part of the rocky stuff that could settle in. And it moves around inside the planet in these big loops that we call convection. Um, so you would like, let's just say that we could hover at the cloud tops and then we started like going down farther and farther. Well, as we go down farther and farther, just like on the earth, we have like air above us that pushes down and that's what we call atmospheric pressure. And as we go farther and farther, that pressure eventually would squeeze us until we basically crushed. So it, it wouldn't take us long to get stuck on Neptune and, and get hurt. What do I think about aliens? That is a pretty awesome question. So this is an opinion versus, you know, science fact. Um, this is one of the things that NASA is trying to answer. So we have the SETI projects, which are um, people searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's what SETI stands for. Um, so we're listening for radio signals. We are trying to explore um, exoplanets to see whether or not they have signals for, or like, um, like life signatures in their atmospheres. So like for us, that would be oxygen in our atmosphere tells us that there is life on the planet Earth. And what NASA is trying to do to explore Mars, did Mars have life? Or does like Jupiter's moon Europa, which has more liquid water than the Earth, does that have life? So that then begs the question, or so that leads into the answer that I think, I think life in this universe is really, really common. I think we're going to find bacteria on all sorts of planets. We're going to find life signatures when we really start looking on a variety of different planets. The difference is, is I think that finding aliens, like what we think of as aliens is people like maybe like us, um, humanoid creatures that can talk with us. I think that's gonna be pretty rare. And part of that is the time it takes for us to develop into where we can communicate or, or figure things out um, is really, really, long compared to the time that we're able to do this sort of thing. So Earth has had radio frequencies, like communication, whether this be like radios or TV or wireless internet type things. We've only had this ability for about 100 years right now. And the Earth has been here for four and a half billion years. So if it took us four and a half billion years to get to this point, and we're only broadcasting out um, into the universe for maybe a few hundred years, because we are getting better and better at like pointing all of our communications in so it takes less energy, it's going to be really hard to find aliens. But are they out there? I believe there's other sentient thinking creatures elsewhere in this universe. Ah, what's so special about the new famous telescope? Um, that would be the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. What's fun about that story is I was supposed to be in graduate school and it was supposed to launch my second year um, and that didn't happen. So um, I've been waiting for this for a long time. But what's so special about it is the fact that it's the first or it's the largest space telescope we've ever spent to, sent to space. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope is 90 inches in diameter. So that's about the, and it's about the size of a like city bus or a school bus. 
Um, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope, the sun shield is the size of a tennis court. And the mirror itself has is six and a half meters across. So that's really, really big. And they had to fold it up, all of this stuff inside of a nose cone of a rocket. And so we needed technologies to do that. We had to develop all of this stuff just to get it into space, let alone make it work. And what's cool about the JWST is that it works in wavelengths of light that we cannot see with our own eyes. So it looks at infrared light. So the stuff that we feel is kind of like heat when we're next to a fire or when we're outside and we feel like the warmth from the sun, that is infrared light hitting our skin and being absorbed. It's the same type of light that we glow in when we uh, turn off all the lights in the house and we put an infrared camera, we could see humans glowing because we're warm and we're giving off infrared light. So that allows astronomers to actually see through gas clouds and we can see very, very distant objects because the universe has been expanding since it began. The universe is constantly expanding. And as it expands, light gets stretched out. So it used to be ultraviolet light, this kind of light that gives us sunburns. If we wanna look at the edge of the universe for that kind of light to see what was going on, we now have to look over here in the infrared because it's been stretched out so much. And that means that we are able to see some of the very first galaxies that ever existed in our universe. We can see, and it's, this is one of the mission goals for JWST that I'm really excited about, the very first stars that ever turned on in the entire universe. Like we could turn on the news tomorrow or put to like open the internet and Google says, hey, first star in the universe that ever turned on has been discovered. That would be so incredibly cool because there's this whole gap um, in the timeline where we know that stars had to form, the first galaxies had to start being assembled so that they can turn into galaxies, but we have never seen anything in that gap because we did not have the technology or the telescopes to really peer into that space before. So that's what makes this so interesting. So here's another question. Do you think it is just as important to study other planets as it is to study planet Earth? And the answer is yes whether it's exoplanets to learn about how different solar systems exist and how they formed and the different types of solar systems you can get to see like how common is our solar system that's one huge question to ask um, but we can study the other planets in our solar system um, mars and venus are two of the planets that we want to study pretty well venus because it's the same size as earth but it's very different than the earth and mars because it we think it used to be similar to the Earth, at least in climate. It used to have liquid water on the surface. So studying how a planet evolves, how Mars has changed over time um, is, is really, really huge. Um, so we can learn about climate cycles. We can learn about the history of the solar system. We can learn about what will happen to the Earth as the sun gets um, brighter and more luminous. So we can um, learn about basically the future and the past of our planet when we study these other planets. And I think that's, that's really, really cool to be able to piece a lot of that stuff together. All right, so I missed a couple of questions. They're in the Q&A, but I am working, working on opening it. So disregarding temperature, would it be possible to have a planet made out of water? So it is possible. Um, it would be hard because you have a lot of other things that are going to be mixed in with the materials like the solar system doesn't say here's where the water is and here is where um, the rocks are and keep them separate. But you can have a planet that is completely covered in water that where there's a more where there's more water that makes up the surface. Um, so if we look at Europa, which is not a planet, it's a moon around Jupiter, there is a big rocky core. But then on the outside of that is like tens of kilometers of water and ice. So it has a lot more water than we had, but the entire thing is covered in, in water. And because of the internal heating, kind of like where the Earth has, has magma and it's hot in the middle, Europa is heated by Jupiter through some complicated things that we don't have to get into. And that allows that water to be heated up and melt. And so we think that there, that's why we think there, there could be life around Europa, because it could be subterranean, it's covered by this huge sheet of ice, but this huge ocean that could be filled with, with life. 
And so it is kind of a water world, even though it's not the majority water. And then there's another question of how do you know how old a star is? This is one of the most challenging questions in all of astronomy. Some of the people in our department, so um, astronomer Mark Pinsano, um, has been working on this for a very long time. And one of the easiest ways to determine how old a star is is by seeing it with the cluster of stars it was born with. If it was born with a cluster and it's still with that cluster, we can see um, how old the basically the most massive star is. And that most massive star only lives a short period of time. And so if it still exists, then we know that the cluster has to be less than the age of that, that star when it would die. So we can actually get a pretty good estimate on, on stellar ages or how old stars are from measuring that. If we don't have that, then it gets really challenging. Um, if they are old stars that are dying, we can measure how they vibrate. This is called asteroseismology, and it's a really complicated thing where we actually see stars vibrate, and then we can determine what's going on inside of them, and we can measure their ages. Um, now, how do we know how old the sun is? Because it's neither of those things. We don't have a cluster, and we don't have our sun at the end of its lifetime. It's in the middle. Well, we figure out how old the, the sun is by measuring the oldest rocks here on the Earth. Um, using a process that's similar to carbon dating, but it's radioactive decay of longer, longer lifetime elements like uranium. And then we measure those same things in meteorites and other rocks around the solar system. We try to figure out the longest time that these rocks have been here. And that tells us when the solar system had to start forming. So it's really, really complicated to figure out how old individual stars are. So that's an awesome question. Okay, here's another one. How many galaxies are there besides our galaxy? So this, is, this number might actually change in the next few months when we get more and more data from the JWST. But one of the cool things that Hubble did was um, they decided to take the telescope and point it to the emptiest part of the sky and stare at it. Now, that seems really weird where we're taking a part of the sky that astronomers thought that there was nothing in it at all, and we stared at it for a month. Imagine using a space telescope that costs a lot of money and then staring at nothing for a whole month. People thought it was crazy, but then when we actually looked at all of the pictures we got back and added them together, we found 10,000 galaxies in this small patch of sky. It's called the Hubble Deep Field and the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Those are two different pictures. We found thousands of galaxies. It's amazing. It is absolutely incredible that there were all of these galaxies. And that's where we were like, OK, so if we take that postage stamp, that tiny little spot on the sky, and we multiply it across all the other spots on the sky, um, so 10,000 times a lot of spots, we end up getting something like 10 or 100 billion, sorry, other galaxies in our visible universe. So this is only the part of the universe that we can see. And each of those 100 billion galaxies have 100 billion or more stars. And out of all the things that we have discovered so far with exoplanets, we think that most of those stars have planets, one or more. So there's another 100 billion planets in 100 billion um, galaxies. So the chances of there being life elsewhere or us discovering things that we don't know anything about is really, really high. These are awesome questions. All right, I see another question. When was Neptune discovered? Um, so I don't wanna <laughs> just tell you when Neptune was discovered. I wanna tell you how Neptune was discovered. Um, so Neptune was discovered in, I wanna say the 1800s. Um, I don't remember the exact date. I'm a, I'm a bad astronomer at that point. So good job, you stumped me. But how Neptune was discovered was using math. They would go across the sky and they were watching Uranus move across the sky. Uranus was discovered by William and Carolyn Herschel um, and they were watching it across the sky and it's doing its small little orbit. And then people were like, wait a second, it's not in the right place, just by a little bit. And it just so happened that Neptune was in the right spot when Uranus was discovered to over the next decades, 
cause gravity to slow Uranus down by a little bit. So it was in the wrong spot. Um, and people were like, well, I wonder what else is out there. And they were able to predict where Neptune would have been if it was gravity slowing down Uranus. So somebody predicted that Neptune could exist and then they went and looked and they discovered Neptune. So I think that that's really, really cool because this was the first time where an idea or like a, a disagreement with an observation gave somebody an idea and we predicted that there would be something else there using mathematics. So it wasn't just, hey, I looked at the sky and I found a planet, but like I predicted that this planet should be here and then we went and found it. And this is what we tried to do with Pluto, but Pluto really was too small and doesn't have enough gravity to make Neptune, to change Neptune's orbit, but it just happened to be in the right place for a crazy millionaire to have built a telescope to pay someone else to discover Pluto. So it's kind of cool that these sort of like it's serendipitous or it's like just an accident that some of these things happen. But Neptune was a planned and predicted planet, which is really cool. So I have one question that says, what is a black hole? So a black hole is, is a, it's challenging to explain in some ways. So it's a place where gravity and matter, matter is so dense and gravity is so strong that light cannot escape. That's what makes it inherently black. Um, so if light can't escape, there's no color to it. So what causes it to have this insane gravity? So if we took something like our sun and we crushed it down. So right now it's this big ball of gas, similar to the same gas that you and I are breathing at some level um, in the atmosphere, so air, um, but it's squished down to make this enormous ball of gas. Um, and if we let the sun, if we just crushed it farther and let gravity win and the sun wasn't supporting itself anymore, it would shrink down to um, about the size, or it would shrink down to about the size of a city, but it would have the density of an atomic nucleus. And that's what we would call a neutron star. So it's really, really weird stuff. They do exist in the universe. But then let's say that we crush it down even farther to the size of the Ohio State University campus, just a little bit farther. In doing so, and we cross a threshold called the event horizon. And the event horizon is where you would need to be going the speed of light in order to escape the object. And all that we know about a black hole is that it is smaller than that event horizon. There's a lot of different models. It could be a new form of matter that's inside of that. But since you can never get information out if it's all inside of the event horizon, we may never know. So a black hole is where stuff can fall into it, but otherwise um, it cannot escape. So I see a question with a hand raised. So I'm going to allow um, Hui Lu to talk. Um, who's the first woman on, moon, on the moon? Who is the first woman on the moon? I don't know off the top of my head if any women have been to the moon. So it's probably someone that's coming up in the next few years as we return to the moon with NASA's Artemis missions. It's a really, really good question. I think that one might be worth stickers. Thank you. You're very welcome. Go ahead, Leo. Um, my friend said there was a such thing as a white hole. Do you know what's a white hole? So um, a white hole is a theoretical opposite of a black hole. So if we think of a black hole as an infinitely deep hole that stuff can fall into, a white hole would be the equivalent of an infinitely tall mountain where stuff is just falling out of it. So it would be giving off light and energy. Now we don't see them in the universe. So what we see, um, when we look into space, we don't see evidence of any of these white holes. However, mathematically, so using, using math and equations, we can say that things like white holes and even wormholes, which are connections between two points in space, do exist. They solve Einstein's equations for general relativity. And so just like there is a black hole, um, these could possibly exist, 
and we just don't see them yet or we don't know how to observe them or maybe they are just the difference between what can exist in our universe and what solves our actual equations that's a really good question all right in the chat leo asks what is your favorite thing about your job so my job is all over the map in so many ways i do the planetarium i teach classes and i get to do a lot of outreach and mentorship um, of, of my own students so out of all of those i do have to say that telling stories in the planetarium is an absolute blast where we can go there and kind of do all of the stuff that i do or like about my job all at once um, I get to perform and I get to learn new things from people that come in and help them learn about new things and we get to explore the universe together. And I think that's just super awesome. So thank you for that question. All right, Hui, go ahead and ask your question. Um, who's the first person to see a UFO? Oh, who's the first person to see a UFO? Have you seen a UFO? No. No? But I heard a story, a bunch of stories of it. So when we hear stories about UFOs, and this is where it's it's hard because I can throw a definition out there of like what it means. It basically a UFO is an unidentified flying object. So that means any object in the sky that you don't know what it is. That could be a helicopter and you've never seen a helicopter before. That would be an unidentified flying object. Um, so it's hard to say what UFOs are. Many of them that I have seen pictures of are just reflections off of glass windows. <laughs> so it's a little bit crazy to think that they were up in the sky, but a lot of it is just, I saw some lights and I didn't know what they were. So nowadays people have drones that are pretty common. And so I get calls about people that see drones all the time, but there's another cool thing that all of us can go outside and find, especially in the winter months. So there's this star called Sirius. It is near the constellation of Orion with the three belt stars in it. And Sirius is the brightest star in the nighttime sky. So the sun is the brightest star in the daytime sky and Sirius is the brightest star at the nighttime sky. And it's so bright that it can actually shine through our atmosphere when it's really low to the horizon. So like think sunset time, but Sirius is bright enough that you can see it near the sunset. And just like the glasses that I told you about that can break the light into all the different colors, our atmosphere also breaks light into its different colors. It acts like a prism. And because stars twinkle due to the atmosphere and it's broken up into different lights, people think that they see police lights sitting in the sky for hours when this star is on the horizon. And so a lot of people call me about UFOs that they see whenever Sirius is in our sky in the, either the morning or in the evening. So who saw the first UFO? I have no idea. That was definitely a stumping, stumping question, but you can go out and see a UFO and it will likely be just one of the brightest stars in the sky. Thank you. You bet. All right. So I see two more questions. How can I be an astronomer? So the best way to be an astronomer is to go outside and look up. There's a lot of ways that you can do astronomy, even at home. So if you want to become a professional astronomer, you need to do pretty well in school. Um, so you need to take math classes and in um, high school, you should take a lot of science classes. Um, and then when you get to college, you'll either take astrophysics or physics, excuse me, both of them will take you to becoming an astronomer. And then you'll go to school longer after you finish your undergraduate degree and finish college. And that's where you'll spend about another six years working on your PhD. And then you spend another six years working as sort of like a proto professor. And then you're an astronomer really that whole time, but then you're officially a professional astronomer. So that's how you can do it to become a professional. But if you have a telescope and you like to take pictures, we have what we call um, citizen astronomers that follow up on cool things like supernova, the exploding stars in space, or these exoplanets um, where they can go and look at these individual stars and they can see the light go down and then go back up, even on telescopes that we can use in our own backyards. And so they add to all the data that we have. 
Um, the other way that you can participate in professional astronomy is doing citizen science. There is a website called Galaxy Zoo or Zooniverse.com. I think Galaxy Zoo is now underneath that. But what you can do there is there's a whole lot of citizen science projects where you can learn about the science and you can help classify different types of things, whether these be craters on Mars, whether these be light curves of variable stars, like we have um, one here at Ohio State that does that. There are also other ones that see how spirally spiral galaxies are. And you are contributing to all of the science that we're doing because no one person can observe 10 million galaxies, but you know, 10 million people can observe a couple galaxies each. And now we have all of these galaxies classified and it means that we can do a lot more science than we would otherwise. So there's a lot of ways to become a professional astronomer or contribute to astronomy. Another question is, what is my favorite thing in space? Things to look at, I love nebulae. I think they're absolutely amazing to look at, especially when you can look at them in different wavelengths of light or different colors of light, even if those that we cannot see with our own eyes. Um, so those are probably my favorite things to look at. Otherwise, my favorite thing that's close to home is Pluto. It's my favorite planet and I, happen to be from the state of New Mexico, where Pluto is a state, by state law, is still a planet, even if the rest of the astronomers say no. So Pluto is my favorite planet. But that leads us into two questions that have shown up in the Q&A. Um, what has the Webb telescope found? So the James Webb Space Telescope is a successor telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it is about 1 million miles behind the Earth. So it's about four times farther away than our moon is from us. And that's so that the Earth's light and um, infrared light specifically doesn't shine on the telescope and warm it up. So we're looking out into space and we're discovering distant galaxies that no one has ever seen before because they're redshifted because the universe has expanded. Um, so that means the light gets redder and redder and redder as the universe gets bigger. It is, it, they're only visible in the infrared. So it means that we can, could not have seen them before. So that's a really cool thing that it's discovered. The beautiful pictures of nebulae and other things like that, I think, are just stunning as always. And then one of the things that I'm really excited about the Webb telescope finding is one of its mission goals, which is to discover the light from the very first stars. So the universe was born and then um, it started cooling off. And so it started to create atoms and gas. And then there's this whole time um, where the universe was too hot to form stars, but it wasn't hot enough to do anything else. So it just sat there cooling. But then eventually it cooled off just enough that the first stars were born. And we have never seen one of these stars, but we know that they exist because you and I exist. And without those first stars, we would not have the elements to make our shirts or our faces or anything else. We need carbon and other heavy elements in order to make planets and people. So we know that these stars had to exist. And I am waiting for the discovery of the light from the very first stars that ever turned on in this universe. And I think that is just so cool that we're going to be able to see that in the next few years. Another really great question is, what is a nebula? So a nebula is a cloud of gas, and there's lots of clouds of gas in space. But what makes them beautiful, the ones that we take pictures of, is that the fact that they're hot. So if we have young, hot stars in these nebulae, they give off a lot of ultraviolet light. So it's the kind of light that gives us um, a sunburn and stuff like that. So it's not good for us, but it's really good at making hot gas and making it glow. So when we look out there, we can see gas that is glowing, and that is usually where stars are either being born or they just died. Um, but a lot of the ones that we look out there and see, like the Great Orion Nebula, is a place where stars are currently being born. That's an awesome question. All right, Oliver, you have a question. What's the brightest star? Ooh, the brightest star that we can see is the sun. So the sun is a star and it is the closest star to us. So it wins because it's really, really close to us. Now in astronomy, um, we make a difference between what we call brightness, which is what you and I see 
and luminosity, which is how much light it gives off. So you can think about it. If I hold a flashlight up to my eyeball, it's really bright. But if I send you all the way across the football field and shine the same flashlight on me, it's not going to seem very bright at all. So distance makes a huge difference in how bright something can be. But some of the most luminous stars, the ones that give off the most energy, are going to be extremely high mass stars that are over a hundred times more massive, made of more stuff than our sun is, and they will be a million times more luminous. So that means they're gonna give off over a million times more light than our sun is capable of giving off. So those are the most luminous stars that we have. Okay. Great question. Ooh, good question, Leo. What is my favorite constellation? Um, my favorite constellation is Scorpius the Scorpion. Um, it is really big. Its claws are actually in the constellation of Libra. It used to be even bigger. And I love the fact that it is the same shape as we move around the Earth and learn about different cultural constellations. So if you've seen the movie Moana, the constellation of Scorpius is Maui's hook in the sky. Because if you're from an island nation that does not have scorpions and all you have is fishing around you all the time, then you're going to probably not pick some weird monster that you've never heard of, but instead relate a constellation back to the things that are central to your culture. So I love the fact that it is very bright, it's really big, and it's sort of the same stars, but they mean different things if we go to different places. Now, another question that Leo asks is if the sun is a star, does that mean that every star looks like the sun? And that is a really, really good question. So the answer is kind of, and also no. So stars that are like our sun, they have the same mass and temperature will look a lot like our sun all the time. Now, if we go to higher mass stars that end up being bluer because they are hotter and they give off a lot more light, they have different internal structures and some of them do not have boiling gas at their surfaces. It's only deep inside of them. The outer part of the star is just still and quiet, and it's really, really boring. Um, so they're actually, they would, they would look different than our sun. And then you have some stars, like in the winter constellation Orion, there's the bright red star Betelgeuse, which makes up his shoulder. And Betelgeuse is a super giant star. So it's not doing what our sun does. It's not fusing hydrogen into helium. Instead, it's in the last stages of its life and it's unstable inside of it. And that is allowing the entire star to puff up, to be huge. And when I say huge, it means that the star itself is bigger than the orbit of Jupiter. So that means all of our planets in our solar system out to Jupiter, which is five times farther away from the sun than the earth is, would be inside of Betelgeuse which is insane. But this star is boiling and lumpy because it's just these huge areas that are just bubbling out of the star. And so it means that it looks wildly different than anything that we've seen in our solar system. And I think that's kind of fun is that we get to go out there and we can study how stars change their shapes. We are just getting to the point where telescopes are good enough where we can measure the shapes of stars and see what is going on and see how they change. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, Oliver, you have a question. What's the brightest constellation? Oh, the brightest constellation is probably Orion because it is the easiest to find in the winter. And I think it is the brightest overall of all the different stars there. Their average brightness is probably at least the ones that make up the, the lines that we usually to make it shape is probably Orion. It's a really good question. Okay, thank you. And then our last question is from Leo. What is the farthest star in space? So um, when the James Webb Space Telescope discovers those first generations of stars, those will be the farthest stars we've ever seen, just period. The farthest individual star that we have seen, I don't know the name of it, but 
it is actually part of a really cool thing that's called lensing, where we have a massive, like it's made up of a ton of galaxies, cluster of galaxies that bends the light from distant stars and galaxies. And in that first picture we saw from the James Webb Space Telescope, we saw these arcs. Those are images of different galaxies that are really, really far away. And those arcs are lensed and sometimes magnified. So they're made to be much brighter and much bigger than they would be otherwise. And that allows us to see structure in these galaxies. And we can, we can learn things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to learn about. One of these galaxies happens to be in just the right spot that a singular star is lensed and made to be you know, thousands of times brighter than it even should be allowing astronomers to take a spectrum or split all the light up from this star that is at one of the highest or most distant galaxies that we have discovered. So I would say that that singular star, because we can study it individually, would be the farthest star that we have seen in space without looking at a whole conglomeration of billions upon billions of stars. So while I don't want to keep any of you too long. We have reached the end of our time. I do appreciate all the questions that everybody has, but I will, I'll just answer this last question real quick. Um, we found fossilized bacteria on Mars. We think that we might have found fossilized bacteria on Mars. Um, so will we find life on the other planets? And I do believe that the answer to that is yes. It won't be on other planets, but it will be probably on the moon Europa that is around Jupiter, where there is a liquid water ocean that is currently in existence. Um, and so we do think that that's probably one of the most likely places to find life in our solar system. Awesome question. All right. So before we, we take off, um, thank you for attending our program. Um, we will continue with several virtual events through this weekend, Saturday, October 22nd. So there's still time to register for other programs if you go to our website, go.osu.edu slash Westfest. If you have any questions about this event or, you know, any other astronomy questions that you might have that you really want to ask, um, feel free to email us as well um, at westfest at osu.edu. And that concludes today's or this morning's program. So thank you so much for attending. And thank you for all of your really great questions, Oliver and Leo. And whoever our anonymous attendee is, thank you so much for those questions. This was wonderful. Have a wonderful Monday.